After the February Revolution, Germany defeated the Russian forces in both land and sea, and the Russian people became increasingly dissatisfied with the provisional government. A force of workers and soldiers, led by the Bolshevik Party, decided to overthrow the provisional government. On November 7, 1917, the Bolsheviks launched an uprising in Petrograd, the capital of Russia. Coincidentally, five main destroyers of the Bolshevik fleet sailed into the St. Petersburg Bay. The sailors on these destroyers also declared their support for the Bolshevik uprising. Early that morning, the rebels organized and occupied major government agencies, key communication facilities, and military facilities, and occupied advantageous terrain after slight resistance. The Petrograd garrison and most of the city's troops joined the uprising against the provisional government. The prime minister of the provisional government, Kerensky, later fled to the United States. This day was October 25th on the Julian calendar, so this action was called the October Revolution. After the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks formed the Soviet government, with Vladimir Lenin as the highest leader. Russia changed from Tsarist Russia to Soviet Russia. At this time, the two biggest demands of the Russian people were peace and bread. But there was no bread, but there could be peace. So on November 8th, Lenin issued a peace order and sent people to negotiate with the Central Powers. The negotiation was held in Brest-Litovsk, which was originally Russian territory, but was occupied by the Germans at this time. In Belarus, today it is in Belarus. When the Central Powers representatives heard that Russia was going to stop the war, they were very happy and sent representatives to negotiate with the Soviet Union. To show the importance of this negotiation, the representatives sent were all big figures, including King Ludwig III of Bavaria, the Field Marshal of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Osman Pasha of Turkey, and a General of Bulgaria. They were all very high-ranking. When the Allied representatives saw the Soviet representatives, they felt a little embarrassed. Why? Because the Soviet delegation had nine people, three Bolsheviks, two social revolutionaries, a party that advocated revolution by relying on peasants to establish a federal republic, and four others, an ordinary soldier, a sailor, a worker, and a peasant. These four were real workers, peasants, and soldiers. Why? Because the ruling policy of the Soviet Union was to rely on the working and peasant classes, so real representatives had to be sent. The two social revolutionaries were also interesting. One was a writer from a military family, and the other was an outstanding woman, Mrs. Benskoff, a professional revolutionary. She had been in prison in Siberia for a few years for assassinating a local official and had just been released. When negotiations began, the Soviet representatives' behavior left the Allied representatives stunned. After exchanging pleasantries, the writer stood up and recited a poem to everyone. The female assassin rudely stared at the peasant beside her, while the peasant attended the meeting and drank vodka at the same time. During the break for lunch, he didn't even use utensils, but just grabbed food with his hands and put it directly into his mouth. This turned the negotiations into a farce, and the Allies said to the Soviets, if there is no sincerity in the negotiations, then don't waste time, just continue the war. The Soviets were also at a loss and couldn't replace the negotiating representatives. So they found a group of former officials and generals from the Tsarist government to act as advisors to the representatives and give them ideas. After wasting a lot of time, the two sides started negotiating again. The Central Powers put forward a condition demanding that the Soviets cede land and pay reparations. How much land and how much money? 323,000 square kilometers and 3 billion rubles. This condition was extremely harsh, and the representatives dared not agree. So they sent the news back to Petrograd. After the Soviet government discussed it, there was a serious disagreement inside. Lenin advocated accepting it all and ending the war as soon as possible because the Soviet government's foundation was unstable. In fact, they could only control a small area in the west of Russia. The east was in the hands of the Kolchak government, and the south was in the hands of the Denikin government. So Lenin said, we have to end the war quickly and bring the soldiers on the front line back to deal with the separatist regimes at home. 
but the leftists, represented by Bukharin, opposed it, saying that they should continue to fight and use their lives to awaken the German workers and soldiers and launch a world revolution with the red flag flying in Berlin. Lenin said, have you eaten too much or have you got a fever? According to Russia's combat power, we can only sacrifice our own lives. The foreign minister, Trotsky, advocated ending the war and restoring the army, but not signing the treaty and maintaining the current state. If so, the Soviets could remain in the Entente powers and seek support from Britain and France. The three sides argued and finally had to vote. 32 voted for Bukharin, 16 for Trotsky, and only 15 for Lenin. On January 30, 1918, the Brest-Litovsk negotiations resumed with Soviet envoy Trotsky as the leader. Before leaving, Lenin secretly told Trotsky that if the Central Powers issued a final ultimatum, they should accept whatever terms were proposed. Sure enough, when Trotsky arrived at the negotiating table, the Central Powers issued the same ultimatum as before, accept or reject. Trotsky telegraphed Lenin, who immediately replied, accept. Sign immediately. But Trotsky, feeling the terms were too harsh, thought that if he signed, the people would accuse him of treason. So, he took matters into his own hands and refused to sign, leading his delegation away from Brest-Litovsk. Seeing that the negotiations had failed, the Central Powers decided to settle things on the battlefield. On February 18, 1918, the German-Austrian alliance launched their Faustschlag offensive, with 47 infantry divisions and 5.5 cavalry divisions attacking the Soviets. At this time, the Russian forces were divided into four main groups, the revolutionary forces, mainly composed of workers, who followed the Soviet government, the Cossacks, who had been the most loyal to the Tsar, but had since rebelled, the peasants, formerly part of the Tsar's army, who now wanted nothing more than to go home and farm, and the Red Guards, made up of workers full of enthusiasm to defend the Soviet Union, but who had never seen battle. According to the military reports, the Russian front line had 173 infantry divisions, dozens of cavalry divisions, and over 1,500 artillery batteries. But their actual fighting strength was close to zero. The Central Powers' attack was almost like a parade, advancing two or three hundred kilometers in the first five days. The Soviet Central Committee held an emergency meeting, with Lenin advocating for the immediate acceptance of the Allied ceasefire terms, but he was voted down. Undeterred, he pleaded and even threatened to resign, until the vote passed with seven in favor, five against, and one abstention. The Russian government sent out a late-night notice to its allies to agree to sign the treaty, but could they really just call off the war like that? Of course not. The Germans kept attacking and demanded even harsher terms. The original 3 billion rubles in reparations was not enough. Now they wanted 6 billion. The Russians had to hold another meeting, and Lenin said, Comrades, can't you see? The terms have gone up. We asked you to sign before, and now the terms have gone up, sign quickly, or they'll go up even more. Everyone else still disagreed, so Lenin threatened to resign. He said, I'm leaving the government and the Central Committee. But Bukharin didn't care if Russia would still exist without Lenin. Finally, Trotsky sided with Lenin, and they agreed to sign with a slim majority. A few days later, on March 3, 1918, the two sides officially signed the Brest-Litovsk Treaty and Russia withdrew from the Entente powers and became a neutral country. They had to pay 6 billion gold rubles in reparations and cede 3.23 million square kilometers of land, land that Russia had spent over 300 years and countless lives to incorporate into their empire. It was some of the best land in Russia, with 90% of Russia's coal, 73% of its iron ore, 54% of its industry, and 33% of its railways. So, Russia had to pay a huge price to exit World War I with the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, not only damaging the national interests of Russia, but also causing a rift among the high-ranking members of the Bolshevik Party, with Bukharin leading the critics who accused Lenin of surrendering. Many officials were extremely disappointed, so Lenin had to punish the ringleader to appease the people. Who was the ringleader? It could only be Trotsky, so he was dismissed. When the Russians pulled out of the war, the Entente powers were furious. 
On March 9, 1918, Britain and France declared that the Russians were too weak to protect their neutral status and that they needed help. That same day, British warships arrived in the port of Murmansk, followed by American and French fleets arriving on the eastern side. Japan also got in on the action, sending troops to occupy Vladivostok in the name of protecting their citizens on April 5th. This was the beginning of the multinational armed intervention in the October Revolution. Even the Beiyan government of China sent over 2,000 people to the Russian Far East and sent the cruiser Hai Rong, led by Navy Captain Lin Jianzheng, to Vladivostok to help the Japanese. At the same time, five river gunboats sailed upstream to the Heilongjiang River, ostensibly on patrol but actually ready to launch an attack in coordination with the land forces. However, with the war in full swing, these countries had no intention of using force and no one openly declared their intention to overthrow the Soviet regime or attack its central regions. After the war ended, these countries stepped up their actions, propping up separatist regimes, but ultimately failed as the Soviet Union had already established its footing. But that's a story for another time. Back to the beginning of 1918, when the Allies and the Russians started fighting, the Germans were the happiest of all. Not only did they have no enemies on the Eastern Front, but their former allies, Russia and Britain and France, were now fighting each other. This gave them the opportunity to give the Allied forces on the Western Front a good beating. So where did the Germans attack and what were the results? Stay tuned for the next video to find out more about the story of World War I.